I want to do a few things today. We've got a few updates um, from various people in the division that I want to share with you. And then I want to spend a little time talking about where we are as a division and where we are as a university in supporting student success. And then a little bit about where we may be going uh, from there. So for starters, um, I'd like to ask David Grady to talk with you a little bit about uh, progress on the IMU and its restoration. So. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on, on the IMU. Um, we're still working with FEMA. Uh, so, uh, uh, it looks like that uh, we're going to go back on the ground floor much like we were pre-flood. Uh, the university made that decision uh, a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, in order to maximize the, the amount of money that we receive from FEMA. We had these grand plans for a lot of different things, uh, but it got real complicated, and we knew it was going to get complicated with FEMA when we tried to go back for, for to get the reimbursement uh, from, the, from the disaster relief. So we're going back much like it is. It's still a, a, a good thing because we'll be back in the ground floor of the IMU. Uh, planning continues. Uh, the first week of class, we had a, a public meeting with FEMA to discuss the historic uh, impact of, of the, the plans to look at the uh, adverse effects of, of the renovation because on the west side, because we're building that wall, we're going to be covering with some windows, and that's the 1925 uh, first edition of, of the building. So it does have a historic impact. So August of 2014 is the latest date. Uh, and so hopefully we can stick uh, pretty close to that date. We hope to have the obligation of funds by the end of this calendar year from FEMA. So um, look forward to, to seeing that. Hopefully many of you will be there in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who may not know, we've added 116 beds to our system, a uh, building called Centerstone, which we uh, leased that property. It's uh, half a block off of of uh, and on Davenport, a half a block from our East Campus residence hall. So that is an honors, uh, returning honors student building. Um, it's five bedroom apartments. We've been able to lease that through uh, probably the, when the new residence hall is built. So it will give us an opportunity in order to house our students and increase some capacity and give our students a different type of housing that uh, we didn't have previously. So um, early returns on that show that the students are happy with uh, with that building. Um, it's about 10 years old, so um, we went through and uh, did about 10 years worth of uh, cleaning in about 10 days, so it was, uh, it was pretty impressive by our staff in order to do that. But uh, that's one of the housing stock we have. So with that and building three at the lodge, which is another 170 beds, um, we've added about 280 beds to our capacity outside of what our normal residence hall capacity is. So um, we've kind of stretched ourselves in areas where we haven't been before, so it's a new and exciting thing for us to be able to do. At the same token, we're also looking at a new residence hall, and that new residence hall is slated to be around 450 beds, give or take 20, so either way. Um, it's going to be on the west side of campus. It is going to be, um, what we were looking at originally was a couple mid-rise uh, towers um, of the same size. We've decided now, um, in order to try to maximize our cost and, and minimize the amount of footprint to be able to allow us for some additional expansion in the future, to be able to uh, go with one higher rise building. So um, we're, again, we're looking at about 450 beds. And it's going to be nestled between uh, Reno Hall and Hillcrest. So it's sitting there in a, in a small footprint, but it's a nice location along Grand Avenue. Still allows us to have some green space uh, within, that, within that space so that students will be able to spend some time there outside in the grass and stuff like that, not on the concrete. Um, we are, uh, we have, uh, since we don't have, I'd love to show you a design of what, we'll, what the building will look like. Unfortunately, we, it says we've kind of revised that. We don't have a good, uh, good building plan for that yet. We do have some floor plans. So the floor plans that we were using for the original building, um, when it was going to be a mid-rise, we're going to use for the uh, high-rise as well. Um, and we're going to be doing some floor plans that are going to allow us to accommodate more first-year students, but also have some designs that are going to accommodate some returning students as well. Um, the focus is going to be on living learning communities, so we're going to uh, provide a floor plan that's going to be uh, optimize the ability for our students to get together, have some community living space on their floors, um, allow them some of the amenities that perhaps they currently don't have, but also keep the, the uh, size of the, of the floors a little bit smaller so that um, we'll be able to either have a large living learning community there or perhaps have two smaller living learning communities there. So we're pretty excited about the, uh, the flexibility that the building provides at this point in time. Um, 
we're also going to try to put some community, uh, some common area space in there as well. Um, if you've ever been in the buildings on the west side of campus, you found that there's no big gathering space for students. Uh, if we want to get a couple hundred students together, there's just no space in order to do that. So what we're trying to be able to do is with that building to be able to create some gathering space for our students. So we're, our goal is to be able to get three to four hundred students there in one space at one time. Whether that be for a uh, seminar, whether that be for dancing, whatever that happens to be, whatever social academic piece we want to be able to do. So along with that, we also want to put some type of food service in there, a small um, cafe type of thing in there. Um, we also want to have a game room space because we don't really have that within the uh, West neighborhood. And then also some other like tutoring space, some academic space as well. So we're very excited about the possibilities that this holds for us because that's um, as you said, as I said before, there's no really good gathering space on the west side of campus. And so, kind of, if you've ever been in Courier in the multi-purpose room, that's kind of what we have for design, except larger and better. So, it's, we're we're very excited about that. As part of the uh, construction of the residence hall, um, we've been able to do that without um, taking down any of our current buildings. Although um, one thing that are in our sites right now is the possibility of taking down part of Quadrangle. Um, we have part of Quadrangle that is. Um, Quadrangle was built in the, I think in the late 1910s, or 1919 I think is about when it was built. So we are looking for, some of that building is kind of old and we're having some mechanical problems with it. And our, our, really what we're thinking about right now is do we invest money into it to, uh, to bring it up to the level of the rest of the building or do we just tear some down? That would be separate from our, from our main project, but something that we're considering in the long run uh, to make sure that we're providing our best services to our students. So that's, uh, at this point in time, with uh, the students we have with the new residence hall, it looks, it'll probably stretch our dining services to about as far as they can go, uh, perhaps a little bit beyond what we can do, but uh, we've been doing that in Birch for about five years right now with the larger, uh, the larger classes. So um, as we look to expand, and we do hope to expand at some point in time, we're, if we're planning a potential phase two of new construction, we are hope to be able to um, add on to our food service right now, whether that be an additional food service in a new location or whether it's an expansion of our current Hillcrest food service, that's what we're going to be looking at down the road. So um, not everything that we do kind of impacts the rest of our residence hall systems naturally. So um, anytime we build some new construction, it's going to impact the rest of our residence hall system. So we're hoping that uh, this will uh, have some really positive impacts to provide some different type of housing that we didn't have before and uh, will allow us, uh, as a residential system to grow, perhaps allow the university to grow as well. So, I'd be more, uh, we're holding questions till the end. I don't know if anybody has any questions about it. I'd be more than happy to answer. Timeline on the residential? Timeline, we're looking at being open in 2015. We're hoping to break ground um, next summer. We intend to go to the regions, I think, in February. February. And so once we get that approved, we're hoping to be able to um, get our construction team together, get a bid out, get it get it going and break ground during the summer 2012 with the hope of being able to open it in the fall of 2015. Thank you, that's a good question. Any update on the Hakai Core, Hakai Tribe area? Uh, we don't, we have, uh, a study has been commissioned. Uh, that study has not gotten in my hands yet. I'm hoping to get it uh, later today. Um, we'll discuss that and then we'll be able to uh, try to figure out what a decision is going to be on that. But so right now we're in a holding pattern. We haven't taken a step back, but we haven't taken a step forward either. So we're looking at um, looking at all of our options as far as investing money into the, the uh, into Hawkeye Court, Hawkeye Drive, or replacing them. Um, that we're still we're still up in the air on that one. Other questions? Yes. The new dorm you said will be right there by. Um the parking, is the parking lot going to go away? Um, ultimately, there's a small lot 13 on Grand Avenue. That will ultimately go away. So that will be a casualty of the new construction. So um, one part of the uh, process is the possibility of building some temporary uh, parking there to facilitate some, uh, facilitate having people there during the time in which that, uh, the building is being built. Uh, I don't know what the other plans are. We've worked with parking and transportation on uh, letting them know that that's not going to be there, and so I don't know what they're planning as far as relocating people are currently there or adding to their current uh, parking stock. So as Sarah pulls up our slide, um, I want to introduce a few other members of the Division Multicultural Worker who are here this morning, I believe. Sorry, I'm looking into the light. I think I saw Amy Ahern come in. Amy's right here. And who else did we see? Wayne, uh, Wayne Fett from Rick. Services and Brad is Brad here. Brad Brunick. Okay. Anyone else? Who else do we have? Okay. Okay. 
So what we're here to do is to give you a brief update on the work of the Multicultural Work Group. This is a group that helps to forward one of the Division's three strategic priorities, multiculturalism, and look at how we as a, a broad organization, the Division as a whole, can be more of a multiculturally inclusive and competent organization. So we've been working together for a couple of years and continue our work together. We're going to give you an update of kind of what we've accomplished in the last year since we were here, give you an update, and also tell you some things that are coming up. So um, I think probably one of the most important things that's happened over the last year is of the leadership level work that we've done within the organization to look at multiculturalism. Um, Vice President Rockland asked the directors to participate in the diversity dialogue circle together as a group, which was a new experience for a lot of us and a, a great learning experience where we got a chance to kind of reflect on multiculturalism, knowledge, awareness, and skills together and to think about how that affects our work with students and with each other. And as a result of that process, I think we um, were asked, each of the directors was asked to set a multicultural learning goal as a part of our professional development plan and a part of our uh, appraisal and assessment process. And Tom also set one of those and shared that with us. And, and we've had a chance as a group to talk about what areas we've chosen to look at in our own multicultural learning. and again, how we're incorporating that into our work on a daily basis. We've also been trying to move ahead with one of our broadest aspirations, which is to have, as an organization, to have the staff within our division have learning goals in this area on an ongoing basis. And we've got several departments that are already doing this, and um, Student Disability Service, University Counseling Service, RAC, and although Health Iowa is in the department, it's an area within student health, all of those areas have had their staff members select a learning goal and use that as a part of their professional development process. And our hope is that long term, all of the departments will find a way to do that in a way that makes sense within the, the course of their work. So that's something that we're continuing to work towards and we'll be kind of getting information, I think, from these departments about how that's worked, what strategies have worked well in doing that, and be able to share those with other departments. Um, the work that's coming ahead for the, for the uh, work group is continuing that work on staff development processes for um, the staff within the division. In the past year, some things that were extended to staff members in the, in the division on the work team uh, were uh, sending some of our staff to NCBI training, the National Coalition Building Institute, which is a, a um, diversity and inclusion training program and to the White Privilege Conference, which took place in Minneapolis this past spring. I think we sent six, five or six members of the work group to that for some further training. And that's sort of emblematic, in a way, of the way the work group sees itself, not as a group of experts or, or the group of folks who've got this, all, this work all done for ourselves and are here to then spread that around the division, but rather as a community of learners. And we have some continuing goals for ourselves as a work group that we hope will, will serve us in, in helping us develop ourselves and may help us develop ideas and share them more broadly through the division as well. We're continuing to work this fall on some organizational development strategies for the division, um, pr promoting staff learning opportunities. You, one of the things we learned uh, throughout our first year of work as a work group was how many opportunities there are available to us right here on our own campus for this kind of learning and development. And we've been assembling that information into accessible forms. I believe we've now got it on our new, uh, the new section of the, revi the revamped um, Student Life website. And you can access that information there. There really are a wealth of learning opportunities available to us right here on the campus at no cost, with no travel, all those sorts of things that your department budget managers will love to hear. <laughs> Uh, this, this year we hope to bring in, a, once again, a, someone as a speaker and consultant to work with us as a team and to work division-wide with us. Some of you may recall that we, we've had sort of events that are division-wide about once or twice a year. Uh, the two folks we're, we're looking uh, at bringing in this year are either Kathy O'Bear or Frances Kendall. We're also looking for folks to help us plan those events. Planners wanted. <laughs> and we do encourage you to visit the website to see uh, more information about the work that we've been doing and what's available to you. 
And also, I think we have a list of all the work group members there, and any of us are happy to answer questions or work with your units, work with you as staff members to help you take advantage of the opportunities that are available and really maximize your learning. A lot of you who were at one of the past town meetings when Provost Butler shared the strategic plan with us recall that we got into some groups and started to think a little bit about how the division could and should be contributing to the strategic plan. Um, and after that, we decided to kind of take that thinking further and did a series of focus groups around the division. I'm going to share the themes of those focus groups with you, and then Tom's going to talk a little bit about some next steps. So in addition to the feedback that we got from the town halls, which is incorporated into some of the information that I'm going to share with you, we invited uh, almost 50 staff members to participate in one of five focus groups. And about 31 of them were able to do that. We invited staff members from across all the departments in the division and just kind of tried to choose some folks from within each department that had a lot of student contact. That was important to us that they had student contact, we included some frontline staff members who were able to participate as well. We offered options for the focus groups on both, side of, both sides of campus, just like the town halls. And then once those focus groups were completed and we had coded the themes from them and generated sort of the take home points, we shared the summaries of that information with the participants to first of all check, check our comprehension to see if we got what they were trying to convey, and also with the senior leadership team within the Division of Student Life and with the Student um, Life Directors. So the next step is to share it with all of you. The, the overarching goal was to try to see if we could identify a couple of powerful ideas that might really help contribute towards the goal within the, the UI strategic plan that's around student success. And one of our assumptions was that we already do a lot to foster student success within the division, we, we know that, but there might be some opportunities to think in a new way about our work, to do some new things, or to take things that we're already doing that have a lot of potential and maybe already have a lot of impact for those students that get to participate and try to scale them so that more students get that opportunity. So those were sort of our operating ideas. Each of the focus groups went through a series of four questions, and these were facilitated by um, Suzanne Fox and me, and we took notes and also recorded the conversations. We started by asking the groups to think about what assets they think we already bring to bear on student success, so what are kind of the, the things that we have that we contribute. We asked for some examples of things that the division is already doing now that are potent contributors and to think about if those are only affecting certain students and again maybe look for some opportunities to scale. We looked at whether there are some things that we're not doing that we really should be doing that we know could contribute more to student success. And finally we asked the groups to think a little bit about our specific role within the institution and if there are, are things that are related to student success that really probably won't happen unless we pay attention to them and take care of them. So kind of looking at our unique contributions. So what I'm going to do is just run through some of the themes of each of those answers and I'm happy to share the full summary with you if you're interested in reading more of these, more about any of these. When we talked about some of the, the assets of the division, certainly the, the staff members who participated in the focus groups felt like there was an ethic of care for students within our division, that we provided a lot of unique leadership opportunities in multiple dimensions, whether it's leading a student organization or going through a specific leadership course or experience. They felt that a key asset that we bring to bear is that we provide the mechanism and the environment for students to make connections both with us and with each other, and that that was really important for their connection with the institution overall. That there's expertise that we bring to bear on student success, that we have a lot of body of knowledge and evidence that we can um, bring to our work. And a big one was that we really um, seem to provide a lot of opportunities for students to reflect on what's happening in their lives and the connections that they can make uh, across their experiences. 
some of the things that that staff mentioned that we're already doing that they thought were positive uh, contributors were that we have been in a division that, that staff felt really has gotten behind a lot of the student success initiatives that have happened over the past few years that have helped them either find homes, kind of permanent homes like Pick One, which now resides in the Center for Student Involvement and Leadership. Obviously, we played a big role within on Iowa in terms of all of the staff members that participated on committees or, or volunteered to take part in that. And that we've really helped the Iowa Challenge, our mission statement for students, sort of get ingrained into the culture by the ways that we've used it within our areas. There are some first year courses that were mentioned that folks thought were a positive contributor. Um, leadership opportunities, the living learning communities were given as an example of something that really hits at the core of work and acad or of academic and co-curricular connections. Mentoring, the critical mass program came up in almost every focus group that we talked about in terms of a, a model of mentoring and something that pot potentially we could look at differently, whether it's looking at peer-to-peer -peer mentoring or just opportunities for students to make a connection with someone who can help them learn the environment in a healthy way. And then the student-centered ethos, which I talked about already. When we looked at some things that could potentially be scaled to provide opportunities for more students, late night activities was one of the things that's mentioned. We already have scaled those quite a bit in the last couple of years to we put a lot more money into those activities and more and more students are participating. But those are a great opportunity, not just for the students who come to those events, but maybe even more so sometimes for the students who help to plan and organize those, the skill set that they develop as a part of that process. Mentoring was uh, identified as something that we could scale, whether it's making the critical mass program bigger, which probably <laughs> I should look at Heather for that, uh, or looking at a different angle of mentoring with regard to peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Facilitating reflection came up in terms of the work that we've done over the past couple of years with student employment, and many of you have participated in that, where we've had supervisors have explicit conversations with their student employees about what connections they're making between work and academics, and that, that heightens learning quite a bit, just facilitating that reflection. And you'll see the other things that are mentioned. Technology came up quite a bit in terms of we're using it in some really good and innovative ways, but maybe there's some opportunities to continue to use it in a way that um, maybe more, not centralizes, but coordinates the communication that all the different division departments are right now kind of doing on their own. So lots of people have Twitter accounts and lots of people use Facebook, but are we doing something that's more cohesive across the division? <coughs> Some of the things that staff felt pretty strongly really wouldn't happen if our staff members didn't care about them and pay attention to them. Certainly meaningful reflection on their experience, on student experiences was one of the primary things that came up. The making sense and making meaning of what's happening as they go through the first year and beyond was an important piece of this. Opportunities for meaningful connection outside of class, the, that that plays a key role in connection to the institution and ultimately potentially retention. And that we, going along with that, we provide some really vital spaces, just like Vaughn and David just got done talking about, that allow and facilitate that connection. I think the CRWC is another great example of something that we've added to the, the list of environments that we provide <coughs> where students make connections with each other and also with faculty and staff outside of class. Uh, staff felt that we probably wouldn't really collaborate meaningfully with faculty unless we took the lead on that and and helped uh, faculty understand how we might partner with them. That they wouldn't naturally be thinking of partnering with us, so we would, we would probably need to kind of take the lead on that. The co-curricular activities, especially late night programs that I mentioned, and the development of multicultural competence among ourselves and, and ultimately among our students was something that staff felt was really important, that it ties to our institutional mission of creating global citizens, but that there isn't really anyone else that's owning that or taking care of that on an ongoing basis, necessarily. 
Some of the new ideas that folks came up with, definitely technology and communication, both how we communicate with each other within the division and how that plays into our efficiency and how we communicate with students. People talked about apps, and these came up at some of the town meetings, apps with everything that students can, everything that's offered that day that students can participate in in a ready format or portals of things to do. On the flip side or another component of technology was the use of all of the expertise that we, we have that right now we provide in a lot of workshops and one-on-one -on -one work that could potentially be done online. Things like time management courses that we might be able to develop that could be tailored based on what answers students might give <coughs> about their current habits in an, in an initial format. Mentoring continued to kind of come up across all of the questions and then multiculturalism and there were a variety of thoughts on multiculturalism. One of the things that came out of that was a, a continuation of an ongoing discussion that has, has been occurring, not just here, but nationwide about the role of cultural centers, centralizing them, or have, having at least one component that's centralized within cultural centers, and a continued focus just as we got to talking about the multiculturalism. Folks really felt like we could probably do more to segment the various populations. Certainly in the last few years, we've spent a lot of time thinking about first year student success on this campus, and we just got done with a, a huge project that we're cycling through for year two with On Iowa that focused on first year students, but there are lots of other populations that folks felt we could make a key contribution to, like transfer students, non-traditional students, just non-first year, so sophomore interventions, for instance. That's a time that a lot of this, the protections of living on campus, if they move off campus, some of those protective factors might not be there, and that could be a potent time to intervene. Um, and then outreaching to stake, outreach to stakeholders, highlighting our expertise. So folks felt like we have a lot to offer in terms of some key stakeholders like faculty and parents and some areas that we could help to educate them and help to partner with them with regard to student success. I think this is the last slide of new ideas. There were lots of new ideas, uh, which is good. Maximizing our physical space, obviously there are some limitations with that as David just talked about, but looking at the role of the IMU, just providing a theme that came up across the focus groups was just providing, just like Vaughn got done talking about, space for students to hang out, to gather, that doesn't have to necessarily be structured and programmed all the time, but that could be just a place for them to be out of class. Ideas around assessment and referral came up, so doing more within the division to systematically identify students that were at risk for problems and then getting them connected with resources through whether, whether that's through case management or proactive screening for mental health issues. Uh, stigma re reduction campaign, is it Minnesota that does that? Yeah, a lot of them. There was one specific. Minnesota has a stigma reduction campaign about seeking help and kind of reducing the stigma around that, normalizing help seeking, and that that could be something within our culture that could have a lot of payoff. And looking at becoming more student-centered, so whether our current structures are most convenient for us as staff or whether they're most convenient for students, looking at student-friendly office hours, and also things like whether there are online resources. So we don't necessarily have to be here all the time, but thinking about when students want information, is it accessible in a really easy format for them to find the information that we need, that they need. And I think that's it. So I wanted to share with you that, you know, Savan talked about making more space and Got the 116 and the 167 or whatever at, at the lodge of more beds in the system. We've got whatever that adds up to. 300, right? Yeah, almost 300 new beds in the system. That's a good thing because we have more students coming in as first year students than we ever have before. And in fact, we have the official number for uh, the entering class um, that just joined us. And it's, again, the largest class we ever had. It's 4,565 people, eight more than last year. So not a lot more, but it is the largest ever. Um, and we have the largest number of students on campus that we've ever had, uh, darn near 31,000. Um, so we're growing. And the other thing that's happening is that our undergraduate student body is becoming markedly more diverse. I, I was just trying to look for that number, and I don't, 
Uh, I didn't find it, but it's over 14%. Uh, identify 14.62, um, or 14.4 would be the average of those two numbers. Um, uh, you know, not long ago we were talking 9%. So this is a pretty significant increase, and it's um, part of the reason that we need to be thinking a lot about our own multicultural competence. We're increasingly going to be dealing with a more and more diverse uh, student body, and we, we need to be prepared to do that. Um, so let me um, pull up a couple of slides and be right back bit about um, the university and about uh, our division um, before I get down to specifics on student success, but I'm going to get there quite quickly really. Um, this is the graphic that summarizes the university's strategic plan. So um, this is um, renewing the Iowa Promise. The last plan was called the Iowa Promise. And the key to this summary is the four pillars. So we have uh, some great expectations for the university and they're, they're arranged as the four pillars of the old capital. Um, convenient that there were four, I guess if there had been three pillars we would have had to dump something. Um, the, the first one is student success, then there's a pillar labeled knowledge and practice, a pillar about uh, advancing the arts, and one about better future for Iowans. Um, the one, we in the division, some of us no doubt will contribute to each of those pillars in various ways. But we're really about one of them, right? Um, our mission as a division is to foster student success. Um, and we do that um, in a variety of ways. But that really is our focus. And that's where I think we fit into contributing to the university's um, attempt to, to meet these great expectations that we have for ourselves, basically. Um, now when we say that we foster student success, it's probably important to define student success. We've got a nice short mission statement. Um, we accomplished that by cheating and putting the definition of student success outside the mission statement. Um, but it, there really are five things that we want to happen for students as a result of their being here and engaging in the activities that, that we present for them. Um, ranging from developing some knowledge and skills through to becoming more effective leaders. And when I think about these uh, five areas that we want students to grow in, um, I think the division contributes to all of them. And then I stop and say, so which ones are we most important to? Um, and it, maybe that's not even a reasonable question in a way. But in another way, I think, you know, knowledge and skills, there's nobody on campus who works with students who isn't increasing their knowledge and skills, right? That's, um, that's probably just, uh, that's what classes are about, for instance, uh, learning things and becoming more skillful. On the other hand, when you get down to multicultural competence, effective leadership, um, those things might not happen in any very large way if we don't do them. And so um, we've, we've focused on three things for the division uh, going forward, the leadership development, multicultural uh, development, and safety and health. Um, how do we do that? Well, I, I did want to briefly share um, uh, our, our org chart. It hasn't changed dramatically, but I, I do want to point out uh, a couple of things. Um, the, the first thing I want to point out is on the left, Student Health Service has two directors, co-directors right now. Um, very, very soon we will be interviewing candidates for a director position and we'll be consolidating that leadership role in one person. and. Uh, taking a lot of burden off the Lisa and Ann who have uh, helped us out by being uh, co-directors on an interim basis. The other thing that's changed that I, I want to point out is um, to the right, uh, the Assistant VP and Director of University Housing and Dining, uh, Vaughn, um, as of July 1st, we've consolidated dining operations. So in addition to contract dining, which is the, you know, the um, meal plan dining, we have retail and catering uh, all there. One of the byproducts of that decision is that students have, uh, who are on meal plans have portability. They can swipe in places other than residence halls. Right now, the River Room, the library, and uh, in um, Papa John, in Tippy. Um, and that's, um, you know, we're going to see how that works out. I know early on we were seeing 100, 120 people 
um, swiping in the river room at lunch. That's taking a little pressure off Burge, presumably. Uh, presumably that's the main place that's taking pressure off. Not a great big deal, but I think it's the beginning of a, uh, a nice thing for students, for them to be more flexible in where they can eat on their meal plans. Um, the other thing I can point out here is that far right, and it fits on the screen. Last time we did this in this room, it was cut off. Um, uh, the Women's Resource and Action Center uh, now has an, uh, I don't want to say permanent, that makes it sound like you never get to retire or anything. Um, the ministry, they call it settled. But um, anyway. Um, rent to own. Rent to own. <laughs> um, a non-interim uh, director of RAC, and that's, that's Linda Crone. I'm uh, very grateful to have that stable leadership there now. Let me tell you just a little bit more about the division. Um, you know, most of you know I started my life as a faculty member and then gradually stepped over to the dark side of administration. And um, I, I, I know there are two sure signs that I have crossed the line and can probably never go back. One is that I can complain about faculty whining now. Um, and and that's, that, I'm, I'm not proud of that, but it's true. And, and the other is that um, budget and numbers are, are, are everything to me. It's not because they're everything to me. It's because they reflect what people are doing. And at the level of abstraction that I work, usually uh, I need those kinds of numbers. So just to point out a couple of things, um, the general education fund, the GEF, is uh, the pot where we pour the tuition and we pour the state appropriations and a little bit of other money and we mix it up and call that the general education fund. So if anyone ever asks, is that paid for by tuition or by appropriations, the answer is both because it's all stirred together in there. Um, that's the, the core budget. It's not the biggest chunk of the budget. You know where the biggest chunk of the budget is? UI hospitals and clinics, right? Um, uh, but it is the core for students. It's the thing that really matters for students. So we spend about $6 million out of that budget a year. And um, I want to point out that um, the last set of slides, the, the slide I updated this from, showed $4.5 million there. Um, and that was in 2010, uh, in fact. What's happened is that the university has really started to focus on student success and recognize that promoting student success is what we do and appropriated funds, you know, uh, appropriately. Appropriated appropriately. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so we're being trusted to make a difference in students' lives. That's, that's the president has, has said, um, let's spend money in the division of student life because that will help students succeed. Um, most of the money, of course, is in auxiliaries. That's units that charge students for what they provide or charge others in some cases. Um, and that's where the big chunk of money is. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it tends to stay with the unit that generated it almost entirely. Um, so that's a less flexible set of money than the general education fund, which, which I can reappropriate. Um, there are a lot of us. There are almost 500 of us who work uh, you know, on the regular payroll for the division. Um, a lot of PNS, a lot of merit staff. We have graduate assistants uh, throughout the division. Um, uh, graduate assistants are really important in two ways. One is um, they bring new ideas uh, to us uh, and energy. And the other is that uh, we have a responsibility to help uh, our profession regenerate itself. And so uh, graduate students are very important. Th they better be because they're actually one of the more expensive forms of labor available. <laughs> um, so I don't think of them as a labor cost. I think of them a as uh, you know, people who help us and who we help. Um, and likewise, we've got a couple thousand bi-weekly students, and I think of them the same way. Um, they get a lot of work done for us, okay? Um, I, you know, I don't know how the dishes would get cleaned without them. But on the other hand, we do a lot for them, some of it very explicit. So you know, we've been working with units to work with their student employees to make connections between the classroom and what they're learning on their job, and they're learning a lot on their jobs. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not, designed, but so my, uh, the guy who sells me coffee at the union on Tuesdays, he's down to one day a week. I, I talked to him yesterday and I said, um, you know, what do you like about this job? And he said, well, you know, the pay's pretty decent. Um, it's okay work. And I often get to study while I'm working. And I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't mind him pay, paying him eight and a half bucks an hour to study. Um, and you know, he's a very serious student. He's a good guy. 
So that's who we are and, uh, and how we're funded. Okay, um, I am going to talk about sort of where we're headed next, but I want to put it in the context of where we are. And I'm going to talk about four efforts each briefly that are collaborative efforts that the whole university is involved in and that we've been really big parts of. Um, I want to start with pick one. Um, so this grew out of a study that we commissioned in 2006, study of our students' experience, and we found out that uh, about six out of 10 said that they didn't do any curricular, co-curricular activities, and about six out of 10 said they didn't do any community service. And in fact, if you ask them, how do you spend your time, the biggest chunk of time was spent hanging out. Hanging out's valuable, but it probably shouldn't be the exclusive uh, way that students spend their out-of-class time. And when we presented these results at a student success team um, retreat, uh, someone, it was Ken Brown, faculty member in the College of Business, said, why don't we just tell them that they have to pick one thing to get involved in right away in their first semester, which of course is counter to what most of their parents told them, which was get involved in your classes um, and, and wait. Um, that's pretty bad advice because what it means is get involved in hanging out, which doesn't actually help you in your classes, whereas being involved in something more structured does. So we said, just tell them that, that, that they have to pick one. Um, you know, they, they won't necessarily know that we have no way of enforcing that. Um, now, some of them do. Uh, some of them figure that out quickly. Um, so uh, a, a lot of people put a lot of work in IMU marketing and design especially into buttons, posters, the big foam finger, um, ways to generate enthusiasm for pick one. Um, this is uh, what the big foam finger looks like when it's wearing a tie. Um, um, and it's very successful. We get about half of our students who actually do pick one and register their pick. Another 25% who don't register their pick, but do have something that they're doing. So we go from four in 10 committing to something to seven or eight in 10 uh, commit committing to do something. So um, very successful program. It's institutionalized now. Um, next thing I want to talk about briefly is the Iowa Challenge. I think most people have run into the Iowa Challenge. It's, um, uh, you, you could describe it in a lot of different ways. Um, it, it, it's a mission statement for students, or it's our institution's comment on what we expect of students. It's part, just like pick one is, it's part of pointing students down the path to success, getting them to do the things that we know matter, uh, that they might not know matters. Um, we didn't have anything like that, and I was very jealous of schools that have a tradition of um, McAllister's four pillars would be an example, or you know, lots of places have three of this or five of that or whatever, um, and we just we didn't have anything like that, and I thought, oh darn, I wish we had something like that, and then we said, well, we could just write one, and four years from now, nobody will know that it hasn't been here forever, right? Um, it'll, it'll be uh, the, the university tradition, and so we've, in many, many ways, uh, tried to explain to students that if you're a Hawkeye, you're committing to excel, stretch, engage, choose, and serve, and, and some about what each of those words uh, means. Um, just briefly on the process, this really is a community statement. I didn't write it. In fact, I've got the one I wrote, and um, I got, I think, two and a half out of five um, of what ended up there. Um, this was a community process. It really does reflect what faculty, students, staff, alumni, emeritus faculty members, anybody with a uiowa.edu address and more, uh, what, what they told us was important. Uh, third thing I want to talk about is convocation. Uh, the university had convocation for many, many years into the early 60s. Um, it was a little different then. It was for all students. And it occurred, um, in the early days at least, it occurred at 7.30 on the first day of class in the morning so that students could get to their 8.30 classes. Um, no, we don't do it that way anymore. <laughs> um, that that wouldn't, wouldn't work today. Um, but we do do a ceremony for new students to let them know that they're entering into a serious enterprise. It's, a, it's an academic ceremony. Um, we march to the stage in our robes. And by the way, academic regalia was not made to be worn in August, um, especially not outdoors. Um, but we haven't had anyone faint yet, um, so that, that's pretty good. We've done this three times, and uh, 
you know, we don't get every first year student there. Um, it wouldn't be realistic to expect that. But, you know, this year we had probably 2,500, 3,000 students there. So a lot of students got the message. And, and they heard us tell them that we expect them to work hard and succeed and that they belong here, we believe in them, and we're going to help them succeed. Um, my favorite part of convocation is the tassel ceremony. Um, so at one point in the ceremony, students are asked to open a sealed envelope, and inside they find this tassel that says 2015 on it this year, because that's their class of 2015. Um, by the way, I think that's an upcharge of like two bucks or something per tassel to get a year other than the one they're producing that year for, uh, for that year. Um, but it's worth it. Um, and we ask students to pin it up someplace where they'll see it every day, remember why they came here. They came here to excel in academics, and it's going to take work to do that, and we're here to help them. Um, I, I genuinely um, get a tingle up my spine every time we do the ceremony, and I've got one right now talking about it. It's, um, I, I, I like it a lot, and some students do too. I mean, I'm, you know, some of them didn't come to the convocation. Some of them aren't impressed by the ceremony. But some of them really are, and I've talked to them. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is on Iowa, which is probably fresh in the memory of most people in the room. Um, this was a humongous thing, and I think of on Iowa as not the culmination, but creating a package that holds everything else we're doing. Um, and it started, um, uh, started with a move-in experience, unlike the experience students have had in the past. Um, they were assigned a time to move in. Most of you in this room um, lived through this and, and are still alive. And it was an amazing experience, frankly. Um, I helped just for two hours, but I helped move uh, people in. And the um, reception on the part of the families who were arriving and on the part of the students was so positive. I got some of the, that's some of the commentary that we got, and there was lots, lots more. Um, students were moved in typically 30 minutes from curb to unload it in their room. Uh, two students per minute were moved in. Um, it, and the biggest thing is, because they were assigned a time to move in, everybody had to be here Wednesday and Thursday. By Thursday night, all our first year students were here. They didn't dribble in on through Sunday, and it made the campus feel way different. Um, it, it created a sense of excitement for those students and for the rest of us um, that was a new and, and wonderful thing. Friday night, um, we took them over to Kinnick, fed them, and then allowed them to go on the field and um, do some icebreakers and some team building activities. Um, they made the giant block eye, which um, it, 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 it's a neat symbolic thing, and I actually think the students liked uh, doing it. They're all going to get a poster, uh, including that uh, picture. Um, and, and it's, you know, we weren't quite sure it would happen, you know, um, but it did, and with enthusiasm. There was one guy, actually, when, when the order was, so the band outlined it, and then first-year students moved into it, and there was one guy who sprinted to get to the center. He, you know, he, he, he really wanted to be in there. Um, all of these students were in small groups led by people like the people in the upper left there, uh, students who were just ahead of them, uh, who'd been trained. Um, then they... Um, learned the fight song, some cheers, and they heard uh, Mitch Kelly and then Dan Gable speak. And uh, Dan Gable talked some about his experiences, and he ended up saying just the right thing, which was he wanted to see the class of 2015 be the most successful class ever at the University of Iowa. It gave him a great um, pep talk. Saturday was a little more serious, uh, but a lot of fun. Um, the students heard a lecture on what it takes to excel here, how, how to take a class and do well. Um, they heard that from one of several award-winning uh, teachers. Um, they had a time with their small group to work on making good choices. Um, and there were a, very, and there were a uh, variety of uh, parts to that. And then they had an opportunity to explore their options to engage, which they, uh, I think, had a lot of fun at. And then Sunday, we wrapped up with um, convocation and the block party at the president's house. Um, which, uh, again, was a lot of fun. So I think most of the students found it to be a fun, exciting weekend. Their tweets were um, wildly enthusiastic, mostly. Um, <laughs> starting at 8.30 on Saturday morning wasn't popular. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, and like I say, I think it wraps up a lot of what we're doing. They got, they got all of the pick one, the challenge. 
uh, convocation wrapped into a, a bigger package so it made more sense to them. So where do we go from here? Um, we will be doing on Iowa again, by the way. Um, you know, we said we'd give it a try. It was so successful. People across campus uh, are enthusiastic about it. So we'll certainly be doing it again. Um, but what's next? Out of the focus groups, the more I talked with people, the more Sarah and I talked, the more it seemed to me that there's two big things in there that are important, that are meaningful, and that are feasible. We could increase the amount of reflection that students do, and, and we could increase the amount of mentoring that happens within the division. We'll talk about reflection for just a second. Um, so one of my, uh, uh, one, one of the bike ride routes I like is uh, north on Highway 1 to Solon, uh, where there's a nice little coffee shop. Um, and it turns out that uh, if I ride to Solon, ride back, and eat a chocolate chip scone, it's still net negative calories. Um, not by a lot, but still. Um, I was sitting there one day, and there were a group of people talking. They were planning a big event and going through all the things you have to do to do that. Well, our students plan events all the time, right? And what they learn is you've got to understand what outcome you're looking for. You've got to map the time backwards so you get things done in time. You've got to recruit people to help you. You've got to organize uh, things. You've got to, uh, sometimes you've got to go beg for donations. They learn all of those things. But I'm not, and, and th so they know something about planning event, but they actually know basic project management, right? That's, that's all the stuff you would do for any project. Um, but I don't know if they know that always. Unless we help them think about what they learned from that experience, they just think they planned an event, okay? And they don't think about what they learned. And we have, I suspect, lots of opportunities to encourage reflection that we're not necessarily uh, um, taking advantage of. Um, mentoring, um, you know, there's all kinds of research on the power of mentoring. And the part of that research that tickles me is that it's the mentor who benefits the most. Um, and, and, and that's good. So if we have students mentoring other students, they're both going to benefit. It's not, a, um, it's not an act of pure um, generosity on the part of the mentor. It's a great opportunity for the mentor. And we do that in lots of places in the division, but are we doing it everywhere we could? So I'm going to appoint two groups, one to work on each of these to assess what we're doing in the division, what's working in the division already, and to come up with proposals to do more or different uh, in, in each of these areas. One last thing I want to talk to you about, and thank you for your patience. Um, there's something that we can do that I, my intuition, not, I don't have any data, um, which is unusual for me, but my intuition is that we could make a big difference without a big expense at all, okay? And what that is, is that we can make a difference by asking. Now, all of us encounter students one way or another during the day. If, even if we don't work directly with students, um, we probably buy things from students. We probably run into them uh, you know, at uh, various gathering places. What if we just, for every student, for every encounter, made sure to ask an academic question? So um, as, I, as I checked out at the River Room at lunch today, I said to the fella, so um, got a lot of homework? And he said, uh, no, not so much. Just, uh, you know, no, not really any homework, just some reading assignments. And I said, you know, you, you got to treat those as homework. I mean, th those have to get done. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got it all prioritized and everything. My dream is that someday I'm going to um, see an um, admissions tour going around. And the person leading that is going to say, I have no idea how this happens, but I swear every time you turn around, someone's asking you how classes are going. Um, they really seem to care about my academic success here. Besides communicating that message to students, which I think would be very valuable, we also have the opportunity to make referrals where necessary, right? So we, most of us know where a student can get help, and if we don't know, we know who to ask where a student could get help. We could find some of those people who are starting to struggle and get them in the, in the right direction just through these casual encounters. Now, it's, I'm, I'm calling this every student, every encounter. I'm, I'm going to accept that maybe not exactly, OK? You know, I, usually the same guy checks me out every day at lunch. And so probably not every single day will I ask him. He's, um, it might be like stalking or something. <laughs> um, but, but if we just made that a part of the fabric of our interactions with students, whether they work for us, whether we're advising them, whether they're part of an organization that we're running, or, or whether they're just serving us 
lunch downtown even. I mean, you know, nearly everybody who serves you lunch downtown is a student. And you can ask them when you're paying your bill. How's your student? How's school going? Um, I, think, I think we could make a difference this way. So what I want to do uh, is encourage every member of the division in every encounter with every student to try to raise the question, uh, try, to, try to ask something helpful. And to help you remember to do that on your way out, we've got these tumblers for everybody. Um, got a few questions on it. It's got an insert to, to help you think about what you might ask. Um, and if you leave it on your desk, maybe it'll remind you that, that, that that's what we do. And once we're all doing it, then I'm going to challenge the whole campus. I'm going to say, you know, in my division, we've made it a practice, too. And why don't, why don't we do that everywhere? And if we do, I think it's going to make a big difference for students. And I'll tell you the other thing. Um, I, at least, uh, find each of those conversations very rewarding, even though they last a second. Um, it's a really nice way to go through the day realizing that um, I'm helping students think about what they're doing. And I get to meet students that way. So, so that's, that's what I came to. Um, tell you today. I appreciate your, your sticking it out. We ran a little late as we um, worked with the technology. But I would invite any questions or comments or um, disputations um, that, that you might choose to offer. And I understand that some of you may need to, uh, may already be late for a meeting or something. And so I won't be hurt if you have to sneak away. Well, I'll be hurt a little bit, but I'll understand. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Have you Tricia. already appointed the leaders for the nope. mentoring? Nope, nope, nope. But um, I'm open to volunteers. Um, don't, um, get your name in fast. It's going to be a lot of demand for those positions. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll send out a solicitation to ask people if they're interested. Yes, Tara. Do you wear a new social media calendar program to launch on campus called Fantasy.com? Yes. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah, because I know that they're updating all of our events and they're taking stuff from our calendar and things like that. Yeah, have you talked with them? Yeah, they've, they've talked with us a number of times about sponsoring events and we're at Mount Palooza. Like yeah. 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 For sure, if somebody will do it for us, um, that's, that's, that's good. If they're a trustworthy partner, I mean, that's, I think, what we need to understand about FAMPUS. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. I appreciate your being here and all the work you do every day. <laughs>